Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's Dan and Matt again, here to talk Calgary Flames, and it's been a weird week for the Flames. They started the week with three losses in a row, and then finally broke the streak against Toronto. Matt, how are you feeling about this rough week? Well, weeks like this happen, uh, especially games like the Pittsburgh game, and it happens. The important thing is, how does the team respond when put into situations like that and they struggled against the New York Rangers last week but managed to get two points and then this week the first two games were just yeah (laughs) so but they did bounce back for the last two so that's the important thing talking to the players in the dressing room after the Pittsburgh game they were saying Chucky and a few other guys said you know what? we haven't played three good games in a row so they realized the New York game wasn't great even though they won they didn't think they played well in Montreal, didn't think they played well in Pittsburgh. Um, I thought they played as well as probably could be expected against the Capitals. And then weird Toronto game to watch with a 0-0 game going into the third. How often do you see that? Yeah, and frankly, the Leafs did not generate anything really until that 5-on-3 that they were gifted late. Well, like, everything, like Calgary was just keeping them... They had a, the handle on it for sure. They did, and uh, well, let's go. Let's talk about that one, but let's work our way forward from these. So let's talk about the Montreal game. Uh, you were mentioning that one. This was a game where the Flames fell short. The first one where they got two goals to the Montreal Canadiens, three goals. Um, Jeff Petrie and Jonathan Drouin each had a goal and an assist as Carey Price tied Patrick Waugh for the second on the Canadiens franchise win list. Overall, what were some of the things that you saw in the Montreal game that were a little confusing? Well, frankly, the Flames didn't really show up for the first two periods. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it wasn't for David Riddick being amazing in the game, like this could have easily been a Pittsburgh-like score. And he was the only reason why it wasn't a laugher after two periods. And... The dam finally broke with less than five minutes to go in the second period, and the Canadians scored three quick goals because Calgary, as a team, just was not skating at all. You and I talked on the last show after the New York game about uh, David Riddick and how he looked. Were you surprised to see him play two in a row? With how Mike Smith has played thus far this season, not really. he, He played so well against the New York Rangers that... You have to give him another shot, and frankly, I thought he matched his performance against the Rangers in that Montreal game, because that easily could have been like a 9-1 to score, just like the Penguins game. I agree. I've got to give it to Riddick. I'm, you know I came into the season kind of skeptical of him, and I, I'm really impressed by what we're seeing so far. Yeah, that was the, the exact same way. Like When we saw him during the preseason games live, it was like... Um, you know, what are we going to do for a backup? But he has shown a lot of confidence in his own game, and he's played extremely well, and that's the important thing. The- he just needs to keep doing it every time he starts and carry the team when he can. What was the, for those that follow us on Twitter, they probably remember, what was the game we were at where we posted the picture of you with the gas mask because Riddick stunk so bad? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was... Yeah. <laughs> and then he was in net. Wasn't he in net for that, like, Oilers prospect game, too, where we got lit up? Yeah. And by the way, that gas mask thing, I was staining a fountain. So, yes. But anyway. <laughs> he didn't just put it on for Riddick. No. But, I mean, just looking at that improvement in, what, like a month, right? Going from the guy who was getting lit up by essentially an AHL Oilers squad to now looking like maybe the best goalie this team has. Um, Quite a change there. Yeah. And frankly, if Mike Smith didn't turn it around uh, against the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight, I think you would have seen more of Redick moving forward. But with having Smith having such a strong performance in the game against Toronto that I think that 
we'll see them still bounce back and forth between the two. We talked a little bit about this last week. I think Riddick really has to play once a week or about once every three to four games just to keep him sharp. What do you think? I agree. And if Smith continues to falter, then I think you start putting Riddick in for, say, two out of three and then or two out of four and see how things go and if Smith can start to pick up his game. And if he can, then great, then there's no problem. And if he doesn't, then the Flames are going to have to look either in Stockton or elsewhere for another goalie. Goalies in Stockton aren't looking too hot right now either. Oh no, that uh, Gillies had a Mike Smith-like performance <laughs> in Stockton the other and day. And Parsons isn't looking too hot either. No. He's got what, .817 it, it, save percentage? Yeah, it it's getting to, you know, putting us in that <laughs> levels of... <laughs> Not so good. They're gonna. They're watch. It's gonna be like Smitty gets hurt, and they call up Nick Schneider. Hey, Mason McDonald. We've heard that you're a goalie. Hey, you're Yay. you're saving some pucks. Awesome. Get up here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um. Hey, you're a guy on the street. Hey, you're in next. <laughs> where, where's Where's Freddie Brathwaite when we need him? What's he doing these days? Maybe we should get that guy that, uh, who was the emergency goalie for Chicago. Yeah. Just fly him out. I mean, Vernon lives here in town. Tyler Moss lives here in town. There's other options. Yeah. Next game was the Pittsburgh game. Do you really want to say anything about this game? Well, this is actually a very important game for the Flames, uh, as bizarre as it sounds. When you get the tar beat out of you, <laughs> and like they really, everything that could have went wrong in this game pretty much did. I believe the technical term is a shellacking. Yeah. Like, it was... Yeah. There have been a few games that I've seen that are like this. And I remember a game against Colorado a few years ago on Valentine's Day that the Flames did that to Colorado. Yeah. It, they happen every once in a while. I think Pittsburgh gave up 10 goals last season to some team. It happens. The important thing Every is... Every team gets blown out once a year. Yeah, once or twice. It happens. Usually not by this much, but every team gets blown out once or twice. No, like even uh, Patrick Waugh, when he was with Montreal, his last game as a Canadian, he gave up nine goals to Detroit. And then he proceeded to tell off the coach and the general manager, and then he won the Stanley Cup with Colorado. <laughs> but, you know, it happens. And, you know, you look at this team, and it everything went wrong okay great that happened now what do you do and the key for this was to see how they'd fare against the defending stanley cup champions i actually i'll give the team some credit here i think they played a good first half of the first period i think they were doing pretty well containing um containing the the penguins i think that you know yeah sid got his early goal and you expect Sid to get those goals but i think it was that right about the time that Patrick Hornquist goal started, they just started giving the Penguins too many high danger chances and too many good positions in front of their net. Oh yeah, and like everybody just kind of like it was one of those weird games where it's like, oh, here's the puck, have a breakaway, you know, here Kessel, you know, you haven't scored lately, have a freebie, you know, and you can blame the goalies for having struggles in other games, but. You know, when things like that happen, it is what it is. And the weirdest thing about this game is, the if you look, the Flames actually had more shots than the Penguins. And I thought personally, uh, watching from the press box, the Flames were doing a great job in the offensive end. There was a lot of good shots, a lot of good chances. But then as soon as the puck went past the red line, it looked like we were playing it, against the Oilers. Like, there was just no defense. Yeah. And... Um, it, it happens, and <laughs> you know. But hey, we won the Corsi battle. You know, that's the important thing. You know, there's no points for the Corsi battle win, Matt. Oh, I know. Um, interesting note here that both Derek Ryan and Yusuf Valamaki sat out this one. This was uh, Travis Hamonic's return to the lineup. Do you think that? I mean, how long can the Flames? And he's been back since. But I was starting to worry here that if the Flames were going to be continuing to sit Valamaki, his time in the NHL might be pretty short. Well, I think Valimaki is playing well enough that he should play in the NHL. But 
if the Flames had another option, I think that he'd be in Stockton right now. It's, with TJ Brody struggling as much as he has been, frankly, I think that that's a large part of the reason. Like, if you're, if he was playing as, like, a number two, three defenseman, like, we kind of had him penciled in, then I don't think there'd be as much pressure on having, like, you could rely on having Anderson and Stone as your third pairing, and that'd be fine, but now it's just a little, it makes everything a little tougher when Brody's playing as poorly as he has been. True. Well, let's let's put the Penguins game behind us and promise we're never going to talk about it again. Deal? Sure. All right, the next game was the Stanley Cup champions coming in for a matinee game. The Capitals ended up winning this one 4-3 to three in extra time against the Flames. Notable uh, achievement here, Travis Hamanick back in the lineup. Got his first goal of the season and his first goal in 71 games. Also his first in the Saddle Dome as a member of the Flames. So I didn't realize Hamannick had been in such a funk. Well, he's not really expected to be an offensive defenseman, so it's not altogether unsurprising that he's had that much of a drought. He, frankly, if he scores five goals in a season, that's fairly good for him. But he has played well thus far, and... I think he's helped to settle Hannafin's game down a bit. Uh, I think that they're both playing better together now than when Hannafin was with Stone. It's one of those things that we'll have to see if that pairing continues or if uh, Hamannick gets switched with someone else. But I haven't had any complaints about him. Overall, what was your thoughts about the Flames' effort against the Champs? Well... Frankly, I thought that they helped to stifle most of what Washington was trying to do. Like, the first two goals, those were just really bad defensive breakdowns. The first one was just, you know, like, you can't let (laughs) players like that in front of the net by themselves. And the second one was a power play goal that... That Oshie goal? the, The... yeah, it, there should have been someone on Oshi, and there wasn't. And, yeah, it was a basically a two-on-one down low, and that's, you know, goals happen like that. And the Niskanen goal is kind of terrible, but it's understandable that Smith just simply couldn't see it because of the screen in front, mm-hmm. so... Yeah, I, I thought overall, especially after the Penguins' effort, the team played better. I, there was a lot of things I'd still like to see better from them. Um, one thing I did find interesting, the Flames won the face-off battle in this game, 55% to 45%, which I think is an accomplishment when you look at the centermen that the Capitals have. But I thought overall a, a good rebound after the shellacking from the Penguins. Yeah, like it would have been better if they got the two points, obviously, but... Frankly, having that kind of an effort against a team like Washington, you're not happy that you only get one point, but hey, it's better than losing three in a row outright. And that tip by Kachuk on the third goal to send it to overtime was excellent. That was one of the better tips I've seen of any player recently. And frankly, games like that, like, if you're losing to mediocre teams, then you get a little annoyed. But when you're playing the defending Stanley Cup champions and you take them to a shootout after getting shellacked 9-1, to one, you, you're fine with that. Like, it's not ideal. You'd like two points, but being realistic, hey, that's good enough. And the Flames finally got the two points they needed tonight. Uh, the game just finished as the Flames were in Toronto and played the Maple Leafs and ended up getting the two points there. This is what we were talking about earlier, Matt, but some of my thoughts on this game, I thought really good defensive effort from the Flames. I think this is probably the best defensive effort we've seen, and I'd say in the first two, they dominated 5-on-5. Five five. Oh, for sure. And this, if the Flames can figure out their defensive game and play like this on a regular This would be a contending caliber team. This is, to me, the model for a road game. Yeah. The problem with the Flames, and we've seen this for a number of years, even heading back into the Aginla era, is that they'd have success 
like, say, like, the Nashville game earlier this season. They shut them out. They completely dominated Nashville throughout the game. Nashville didn't really generate any scoring chances, one scoring chance in the whole game. And then it's like, oh, we're awesome now. And then they go and get their <laughs> behinds handed to them by St. Louis. Calgary goes into a very hostile Toronto Maple Leafs building against one of the hottest and best teams in the league and completely shut them down. They're the most electric offense in the league and they only gave up one goal on a five on three. Like, there's not really much you can ask more from a team than that. Yeah. It, the, now, this, just like the Penguins game, though, is a bellwether to see, okay, you did this. How do you respond? And Especially the next night. Yeah, and they're playing again tomorrow, and it's key for them to play not necessarily as good because, like, they really dominated this game. But they need to go and thump the... I think we're playing Buffalo tomorrow, right? Yep. Yeah. It, they have to go thump the Sabres and get two points. And show that, yes, we can play like this. And we're not going to get our heads <laughs> out in the way thinking that we're all great because we had a good game. And go and kick the tar out of some other team at, right after. See, to me, I don't even think you need to kick the tar out of the Sabres. I think if we can play that same type of defensive road game, that's all I really need to see. I mean, yeah, it would be nice to get the two and to kick the tar out of them, but I think if we can keep that defensive road game going the next day in a back-to-back, -back, I'd be happy. Oh, for sure. but Even if it costs us two points. Yeah, but I think that one would follow the other. If they're playing well defensively like that, they'll they'll get the two points. Cause, yeah, for sure. But, I mean, so, as we've seen, you hit hot goalies, that sort of thing. Like, oh, yeah. As long as they, they play that way, I'd be happy. Yeah, and, like, that's one of the hallmarks of this team uh, heading back for eons has been the lack of, like, a killer instinct. And, like, it's like when they start doing things right, then they start immediately doing things wrong. And the Flames, in order to take that next step into becoming one of the better elite caliber teams is playing that well and then carrying it on and playing that well again and then going on and playing that well again you're gonna have off games but you need to be consistent in your approach not good for one game bad for like five then good for one well and you need to play the same type of game like how often do we see the flames go on a road trip seven games and we get seven different calgary flames games oh out? i know and that <laughs> That's a little frustrating too. <laughs> you know, like you not you need you don't need to play the same game, but you gotta have the same basic principles and systems to your game. And that's what I'm saying. If we can at least keep that same defensive consistency, I think we're doing well. True enough. Well, Matt, we talked a little bit last week about the Calgary Flames defense and a little bit tonight as well about Yusuf Valamaki and where are guys gonna fit into this lineup. And for two games now, um, Michael Stone, number 26 on this team has been sitting out he's making a lot of money but the calgary flames that uh, he's making let me just look up exactly how 3. much 3.5 i think uh 3.5 yeah and we got him for one two three more years including this one sitting out is the number seven i'm not saying it's the wrong idea i think he's the guy that deserves sit out but what do you think is he now the number seven defenseman on this yeah, team? yeah i think so it it's one of those weird situations where Anderson, Valimaki, and Hannafin, being as young as they are, have looked really good for most of their time. Like, Valimaki's had some struggles, but they have been, all three of them have been the better option of the players. I'd put Hannafin in a different category. I mean, he was brought in with NHL experience. True, the other two but they're all the same age, roughly, so... They're all under 21, yeah, so that's why I'm lumping them in, cause, him in with them, because, you know, they're all really young. How long do you think until we see Dalton Prout sent back to the farm? Uh, I think he's just there in case of we need a tough guy, and then I, I think you might even see him slot in as a forward for a game. I don't know about that. We got... We got uh, Palooza we can call back up if we need to. Yeah. I just think that Stockton really needs some right-handed defensemen, and they'd probably die to have Prout down there. 
Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if that happened. So what do you think Michael Stone, at least for the next month, do you think they're going to try and rotate him in? I mean, we've heard Peters say that he doesn't want to sit the young guys, which really doesn't leave you a lot of options. Or do you think it's one of these, you know what, Stone, you're just going to keep uh, sitting in the press box and eating popcorn until somebody plays themselves out of a spot? Yeah, I think so. I basically, the only guy I could conceivably see sitting for him would actually be TJ Brody. And okay. that's if Brody has continues to have really bad games, then I think he needs to sit for a bit. And, you know, a game or two wouldn't hurt. But unless somebody gets hurt or whatever, I think Stone will just be having some popcorn. And, you know, the Flames will probably eventually end up trading him just because. See, I think if he's lost his spot to two brand new rookies... His values just plummeted. Uh, not necessarily. You have to also look at how well the rookies are playing. It, you know, because sometimes like good players do lose their spots, not because they're doing anything particularly wrong. It's just they're getting outplayed. And yeah, I'd say in this case, those stones doing some things wrong. True, but you know there are teams out there that would. Well, frankly, most teams only have like five decent defensemen, so. You know, yeah, Stone three point five million's on. a lot to take on. Yeah, and there's overpriced forward contracts that you could conceivably take in exchange that like wouldn't be terrible players, but like say like it, for example, like with say Ottawa, like Zach Smith for we're gonna Stone. talk about Smith again. Well, I only bring him up just because we've already mentioned him, so. It's easy to remember that one, so... Okay, you're thinking Stone wants to go play with his brother. Yeah. Oh, it would work. You know, that would be, like, the framework of a trade that you'd see. Like, I don't see... Or, like, if the Flames were to go for a top goalie and, like, Smith and, like, Stone's included just to... For cap reasons. I think at this point, if you're going to trade him for a forward contract, you'd rather just hang on to him. True. I think right now it's flip him for a decent pick or hang on to him. Yeah. Either way, it doesn't really matter much. We'll see. And you were mentioning, you know, TJ Brody, and we talked about Brody last week potentially coming out of the lineup for Stone, but to me they're making a lot of the same mistakes. Like when I see TJ Brody and Michael Stone play, I don't know if one is necessarily better than the other. It would just be a, okay, almost like a timeout for Brody. Yeah. And put Stone in, but I don't know if that's necessarily a better choice. Yeah. Now, for me, if I'm looking at this team, I'm and those three defensemen, I'm going. Can we get away with not having TJ Brody on the team anymore? And that's a question that has to be asked, you know, because there are some good players that would be available for a TJ Brody. And you could get a, another decent top six forward for a Brody. Do you go that route? I'm not willing to move TJ Brody for a forward. I think, A, we have enough top forwards, and I'm not confident with the defenseman without Brody somewhere in them. I still think Brody's useful as a second or third pairing guy. I think if you're going to move Brody, you've got to bring back a blue liner. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to call up... Shillington, that's not really going to do us much good. If if we weren't going to make the playoffs this year, I'd say, yeah, it's time to move on from Brody. Otherwise, with uh, this year and two more, I think that he stays this year. But I can definitely see Brody being one of the big bargaining chips, either the draft or the deadline next year. Yeah. Well, one thing that I could – it would make a little sense. And you better I not say Hoffman. Uh, no, uh, actually, Nylander from Toronto. Uh, us adding guy, a couple of decent other players like Jankowski in the deal. Matt, believe it or not, Dubas was at the game tonight. Oh, really? That's brand new information. <laughs> what Maybe was he doing there? <laughs> yeah, but again, it's okay, so we're trading for Nylander, but... Do we need another forward at this point? I know. It, it's one of those 
And that also ties up with, with a big Kachuk contract in the in the off season. I really don't want to tie up a lot more money in a forward. I uh, and I can agree with that. Yeah, that would be a little bit ridiculous. You know, I mean, if you're bringing in Kachuk, I think right there you either have to make a big trade to move somebody out to make room for uh, Kachuk, or you're not going to be able to re-sign Kachuk. So to me, I don't think we are at the point where we need to bring on another big deal. I think you've got to kind of work with what you've got. Maybe trade Brody for someone else's slumping defenseman, and it's just a change of scenery trade, and we see those all the time, but... I, I, I'm not comfortable getting rid of a guy I still think can be part of our top four um, for a forward. I don't think we need to do that this year. Last year, yes, but I'm pretty happy with the top nine of this team. Yeah. It'd be kind of amusing, though, if at some point the Flames rolled a uh, defense that was Giordano, Hamannick, and then four kids with Shillington being the other guy in there. Yeah, it'd suck after the game because your first pairing would be able to go for drinks and the rest of them would have to go back to the hotel. True. <laughs> Designated again, drivers, this, everyone, you know. <laughs> if this wasn't a playoff year, I could definitely see doing that. But if you think, let's say, put it this way, Matt, round two, round three, who would you rather have somewhere in the in the lineup? Would you rather TJ Brody or Oliver Shillington? Well, obviously, you know. You know, like I think if if this team is serious about making the run like they say they are, you got to keep Brody for this year. Yeah. And hopefully Brody can do like a Michael Furlan, look great, and we can trade him while the value is high in the summer. Yeah. Well, additionally, because of his good contract, you'd probably get a uh, King's Ransom for him just like we did. We had to pay for Hamannick. Yeah, it, it's kind of tough, but... I think the Flames could get away with something along those lines if they were to acquire another defenseman, say, at the deadline or something like that. But, yeah, it 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 would be tough to go that route. But it, it's a possibility, at least. And you'd kick the tires, at least, to see what's available. You wouldn't necessarily go too far down that garden path, though. Uh, in the Penguins game, we actually saw the starting pairing of Giordano and Anderson um, instead of Brody on that pair. And I thought those two looked good. I mean, I've said it before, Giordano makes anyone he plays with look good. Hamannick dropped down the lineup a bit. Or not uh, Hamannick, Brody dropped down the lineup a bit. Maybe, again, that's kind of what we need to do. Instead of sitting him, maybe it's just giving him less minutes to get figured out whatever he needs to figure out. Yeah, and Anderson has looked really good this season, so... I have no complaints with him getting extra ice time. Now that we have uh, Hamannick back, what would you think of trying the first pairing of Geo Hamannick and the second pairing of Hannafin Brody? Uh, when I think that I don't think that Giordano and Hamannick have compatible styles of game because of the fact that both of those guys play a very good defensive game. Like Giordano can jump in, but offensively, but you're not like it almost makes more sense to have them split up so that way they can cover the deficiencies defensively of the other players that are on their pairing. Yeah, uh, you're probably right. Maybe those two would be a good special teams pairing, but I don't want to break up Valamaki Anderson right now. No. So you got to shuffle the other four around. Mm hmm. Well, we'll see what happens with Brody. I know where you're going, and I think Brody's going to be this year's... I was talking about this um, at the last game that was at the Penguins game. Who's going to be the scapegoat this year? We're, we don't have the Brower contract. Who are fans going to be you know, calling for their head? And I think it might be Brody. Yeah. Well, you, you look at like a lot of people prior to the season starting were already saying, oh, for a leak, and thus far through 12 games, he has five goals. So it's like... Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> and to be fair, you and I were saying Brody is probably the guy to leave at the end of last season. It's one of those situations where the Flames kind of got lucky with their defense. And, like, they have three dynamite guys that are 21 years or younger. And, like, that's half of their defense core is set for a long, long time. So you can kind of afford switching some personnel out that you wouldn't normally consider just because of the fact that those guys have stepped in and played as well as they have 
And I still believe that Brody would be the guy to have left if it wasn't for uh, Hamilton. I don't think they were looking to move Hamilton. I just think a good deal came along. Yeah, and frankly, that deal was a steal by us. I, mean, I know not, Furland I think and, Brody would have been out of here. Yeah, I think uh, like despite Furland uh, and Fox doing well for Carolina, uh, you know that that deal for me is still a huge win. Well, let's well, take eight goals for Lindholm. You know, like that's. Let's take Fox out of it because he's sort of the intangible. We don't know what he is in the NHL. But, yeah, Furland's looking good, but I still like Lindholm better. Mm-hmm. Same here. And Dougie's not doing too hot. No. And, frankly, it, a lot of his problems were his lack of defensive judgment. And, like, Hannafin has his struggles in that department as well, but they're not nearly as pronounced. And he doesn't take a dumb penalty every game. Well, and Hannafin also being 21, I think we can still coach them out of him. Yeah, and the fact that he's not taking penalties all the time where Hamilton was, that goes a long way to help as well. Yep, I think I I, I said this when the trade was made. I still think that as Flames fans, we're going to be much happier with Hamannick down the road and looking at a guy like Mark Giordano, who I think has three, maybe four years left in the league, I think that Hannafin's being groomed to be the new number one. I agree. I think, frankly, I think in say two years' time that your number one pairing is Hannafin Anderson. You know that would be awesome if for no other reason than we're kind of ticked off the year they gave up the first for Dougie. We got Anderson in the second round and Shillington in the second round, and so kind of say, hey, you know that made itself. I mean, really, then Hannafin becomes what you got out of that trade, and Anderson's the guy you drafted. It looks like a great year for the GM. Yeah, well, we basically traded the 15th overall pick in two seconds to move up to number five to get Hannafin and still end up getting the other two guys in the second round. So, Well, in that case, then, that whole draft between trade and picks would give you your, to- your top two. Yeah, and Shillington is looking decent in Stockton, and if not for the log jam, probably would be up here too. No, and I mean, it's a long season. There's going to be some injuries. Yeah, and frankly, I could see him playing a few games as well if a couple of injuries happen. So as of right now, the Calgary Flames record, looking more like what we're used to for an October, is 6-5-1, and one, which puts the Flames uh, eighth in the West right now. And I think you said it before the, uh, before the show that we're guaranteed 500 hockey in October from this team at the very least. How do you feel about being eighth right now? Well, not ideal. And frankly, if Mike Smith had played like an NHL goalie for most of the month, like he had a couple of good games, but was just frankly abysmal for a lot of it, I think the Flames could have an extra two, maybe three wins out of the deal. But on the whole, you got a new coach, a whole bunch of new players, and a completely new system, and your toughest month on the schedule in terms of the quality of competition. You come out of that 500, eh, I'll, I'll take it. And uh, to be fair, know. the Flames are at 13 points. The best team in the West is Nashville at 16. So with a win tomorrow, as long as everything else stays the same, we can tie for third. Yeah. So it's like, oh, gee, we had a really bad month and we're third. Gee, you know, that's really horrible. <laughs> but you know, you as know. you as you've said a few times, we need the points now to start building up a bit of that buffer. So when the eventual losing streak happens, we've got some buffer in points, and I'm glad to see they're doing that. Yeah, because frankly, them being at where they're at, that's a lot better than in previous years, and it gives them a good foundation moving forward. Especially because of the fact that this month's schedule was really quite horrible in terms of the quality of the opponents yeah we'll look ahead to november in a bit here but it was it was an interesting first month and really i mean if you look every other day they were playing for most of the month so you know a lot of and some weird trips like i still don't understand this they went east to play boston nashville or sorry they played boston nashville here then they went east to play new york and montreal then they came back here to play eastern teams in Pittsburgh and Washington. Now they're going back east to play Toronto and Buffalo. Like, who's making the schedule? 
I know. You could have just made it a four game road trip and then the two home games, but Yeah, or make it a six game trip and do New York, Montreal, Pittsburgh, Washington, Toronto, Buffalo. Yeah. I know. A little weird, but So it lots is. of weird travel there too. Well. But we'll we'll look ahead to November in just a bit and see if we think the schedule looks any better there. Before we do, though, I wanted to um, uh, to answer a fan question. So we actually had somebody text us at our texting line here. And the texting line, again, we've mentioned a few times, is 587-200-7176. And you can text us or call us after any game or any time you have a Flames thought. And if it's intelligent and something that where you don't sound like you're drunk, we'll probably answer it on the show. Um, we've had a couple people already, and we've also had a couple of those uh, CRA scammers call us. We're not going to put them on the show. Um, but we have Robbie here who texted us, and Robbie texted us after the Washington game, and he asked us, uh, what do you guys think about Sam Bennett? He's looking better. Should he stay on that first line? We saw him on the first line for which game last week? I'm trying to remember. Was it the Pens game that he started on the first line? I think so, yeah. Um, and he's saying, should we keep Bennett on the first line or move Lindholm back there? We've kind of seen that since, but let's talk about this. Matt, why don't you give your thoughts first? Well, Sam Bennett has played better, and I wouldn't be opposed to having him move up the lineup, but I'd probably put him with Kachuk and Backlund more than moving him up to the first line. Just uh, stylistically as a player, he does not really suit Gaudreau and Monaghan. Because he's more of a physical guy, and it just, it's not as good of a fit. It, like, Lindholm and Gaudreau seem to have insane chemistry where they're finding each other on the ice, as if they're the Sedins, frankly. Like, some of the passes that they made with each other have been just ridiculous. So, you know, when you have a good thing going with those guys, as long as, like, Lindholm is continuing to score goals at like two every three game pace then hey that's a-okay in my books yeah you and i have talked in the past about sam bennett and how good he's looked when he's played with goudreau in the past and i think maybe that's why they wanted to put him up there and i think you know sam bennett is looking fantastic this season so far i'm excited to see him play every game which i can't say in the last little bit but I really think that him and james neal are a better fit than him on that top line i just think that he can probably have some good shifts there, but I don't know he's the consistent guy they need on every offensive rush. And I agree with you. Lindholm's doing a great job. I mean, we brought Lindholm in for that line. We might as well use him there. Um, he fits well. He's a great partner. I think maybe you put Sam Ben up there. Maybe if, let's say, we're up by you know three or four and you just want to try it out, let's experiment. But for the majority of the time, I think Bennett and Neil being, let's call them line three, with whatever center you want to put there, Janko or Ryan or whoever, I think that it's important that we have that depth, and I think that Bennett and Neil are becoming a great pair, and I want to see them on a different line. Yeah. And uh, Mark Jankowski, speaking of him, he has to play better. Well, I said last week, I think he might be coming our 13th forward. Yeah, he really... He gets some good chances every once in a while. It's just then he fades into the background and you don't see him again. And yeah, but you could say the same for a guy like Derek Ryan. I mean, I think it's bottom six forwards on this team. That's going to happen. Yeah. Just that you'd expect a little more from him, especially with the, the 17 goals last year. That you, you, You're not expecting him to light the world on fire, but, you know something and we're not really we're seeing more of like a joel colborne with colorado type season from him and that's not very good i think bennett and neil are gonna get going i think they're sort of like last year we said bennett and janko needed someone like yager to kickstart that i think that bennett and neil need a centerman there um maybe you try bennett but i i think bennett dube neil is the way to go on that line and Janko might need a sit, or you rotate Janko and Zarnik out with Ryan. Yeah, and James Neal, he's starting to look like James Neal now in the last handful of games. Starting to look he, like the real deal? Yeah, it, for the first handful, like, frankly, he was bad. But, he, you know, that's to be expected with how many games he's played and all of that. 
but now he's starting to look more like himself and the shot quality is going up and that's the important thing because those will eventually go in i've always looked at neil who was there, there's guys in the league who look good no matter who they play with there's guys in the league who look good when they're playing with you know a specific guy but i've always looked at neil as one of those guys who needed a good line mate to really be effective and i think that he's bounced up and down the lineup and he's found bennett and i think Leaving those two together, you're going to get the yeah. most out and of Neil. I'd almost be willing to try Bennett as a center again just to see if, because there are more options available to you as a secondary uh, player on that line if you can make Bennett a center again. But Yeah, and then, I mean, you can put Zarnik on the left wing. You can put Dubay exactly. on the left wing. You could even maybe move Hathaway. Actually, I wouldn't move Hath up there, but... Yeah, I think Dubé, Neil, Bennett in whatever configuration you want to put those guys is worth exploring for a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, I know that they like Bennett and Jankowski, but you're right. Janko, I, he's just he looked good last year, and I don't know what's fading out there, but he's quickly – I mean, he was scratched in the, um, in the Washington game. He played again tonight in Toronto, but to me it looks like he's losing his spot. And frankly, he did look a little better tonight. But still, there's more there, and he needs to keep it up. And I think either that or he needs to transition to being more of a defensive centerman. Yeah. And also on that defensive-minded zone, uh, for Sean Monaghan to take the next step in his career, he needs to become better defensively. Yeah, because he could be a Jonathan Taze like player who can be dangerous at both ends of the ice but right now I thought tonight in toronto he and goudreau played the best game they've ever played without the puck yeah i agree and that's more of what you need to see from them because it, it, it's like look at a guy like steve eiserman like we think of him as like oh he won three stanley cups but before that he was a hot dog i you know and would score like a hot he had 155 points one year and he was not a defensively responsible player. And he eventually learned, uh, I think it was Scotty Bowman that uh, taught him how to play defense. But he remade his game, and then that's where Detroit finally started getting some success. And you look at Ovechkin, he was, played very much in that same manner as Iserman did early in his career, and then the last couple of years, he's changed his game around and has been more responsible defensively. Washington wins the Stanley Cup. And you can see, like, Monaghan has very good offensive instincts, but defensively, he's not very good. And, like, if you look at the top-tier centers around the NHL, guys like Kopitar, guys like Getzlaff, he can be in that tier with those guys, but he has to... It, all of those guys are good on, on their side of the puck as well as the offensive side. Same knock we had on Jerome, right? Yeah, exactly. And Great with the puck, didn't look good without, needed someone to cover. I think Lindholm can cover that a little bit, but I think both Johnny and Monty need to get better off the puck. Yeah, and that, frankly, is one of the things that's held the team back to an extent. It, not a huge amount, but those guys for the flames to take the next step from being just a mere playoff appearance team to a, a team that could actually do something they need to take that next step in their game and be able to play at both ends well and we talked about it last year we don't need to have a big conversation about it but i predicted last year i think after we seek a chuck sign a big deal I think he's going to become the number one left winger and overtake Goudreau for that spot. And I think within three years, Goudreau's no longer a flame. I actually agree with you. If Goudreau doesn't change his ways as well. but well, I just think money-wise, like either way, Goudreau's not going to be a flame. And I think if they can sell early, not like the Jerome deal, yeah. if you can sell early, you can get whatever. I mean, if we need a goalie, we can get a goalie. If we need a defenseman, we can get a defenseman. If we need an arena, we can get an arena. Like... You you can get whatever you need for this guy. Yeah. Well, if like, we need uh, money for the Olympics, we can probably get that too. Yeah. Well, I think like that's why like I, I was somewhat 
looking at like the concept of trading Gaudreau for the pick that uh, was selected for Brady Kachuk and some other pieces coming our way just for that reason and you know I think if Gaudreau gets traded it's either to Philly or New York yeah it'll Jersey. be an eastern team for sure well I think it, like he's from that area I mean he's you know he played in Boston he's from Philly I think so I think he goes back to not just the east but that sort of you know New York area yeah whether it's Boston itself or whatever, any of those teams in that area. Well, while we're talking about the lineup, uh, 3M line back together. We talked a little bit about it last week. What do you think of that line? Working perfectly fine. If it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? I think yeah. it's I think it's really got Froleek back to where he needs to be. As you and I talked about, I think Froleek was the odd man out coming in, and now he's made himself look that much more valuable, so good for him. Yep, and he just needs to keep playing well. Yep. So to me, we've got, you know, the Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm line. We've got the 3M line locked in. I think Hathaway and Ryan are a pair. Bennett and Neal are a pair. We just have to figure out the other parts of those two lines. Yeah, I agree. It almost seems every week we're kind of locking in a line, and maybe by, you know, November we'll have all four of them locked in. Yeah, well, also, like, the team is starting to get the system in place and understand how to play Peter's game and... That usually, like, I remember um, Darren Haynes uh, writing an article about how, like most coaches, it takes 15 games or so for teams to start getting their act together. So it, it, we're getting close to the end of that 15 games, and so now we're starting to see, at least in the Toronto game, that they're playing the right way. Whether that continues or not, stay tuned. <laughs> 15 games by my count will be November 3rd against Chicago. Yeah. Well, before we look at the week ahead, why don't we preview the November schedule? As you were mentioning, it, October was a little bit of a hard month for the team. If we look at November, they play a two-game homestand to start off against Colorado and Chicago. Then they get three days off where they go on their uh, California road trip after that. So they have Anaheim, two days off, L.A. and San Jose back-to-back. Then they get another three-day break. They're back here for a four-game homestand, Montreal, Edmonton, Vegas, Winnipeg. Then they go back to Vegas for a Friday night game. I feel like everybody plays in Vegas Friday night, probably for the tourist dollars. Uh Um, And then they have a road game against Arizona, and then they're back here, Dallas and L.A. So of all those games, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight games at home and five games on the road. So I think this is the month... I mean, if you look, at, if you believe in the home ice advantage, this is the month for the Flames to make up some points. Yeah, like if you look at the quality of the opponents, Colorado's decent, Chicago's decent, Anaheim's decent, San Jose's decent, and LA, eh, LA is kind of bad this year. Um, Winnipeg's good, and then, Montreal's not that great. Yeah, Edmonton's like every great. everybody else, Vegas is kind of okay. L.A. twice is kind of okay, and Arizona's playing well right now, but, you know, that they're kind of a random toss-up, and I don't think they'll be very good either by the time we yeah. play them at the end of the month. Yeah, so we'll, it, it looks like a lighter workload for the team. Yeah, it, like there's good games against good teams, but, you know, there's also a lot of games against the middling to lower-end teams, so... Well, that, that, and when I look at this November lineup, I also see a lot of games where I would probably start David Riddick. Yeah, same here. Well, let's preview the next week of games instead of all of November, as we always do. If we look back at last week, neither of us uh, got this right. You thought that the Flames would win in Montreal and Washington, lose to Pittsburgh and Toronto. Or, sorry, that was my prediction. You thought they'd win Montreal, Pittsburgh, and Washington, and lose to Toronto. And as we know, they did almost the opposite of both of ours. They won to Toronto, lost to Montreal, Pittsburgh, and Washington. Yep. So we got three games this week. They have the back-to-back in Buffalo uh, tomorrow night. Then they have a couple days off. They come home, and the 1st of November is a 7 p.m. start time against Colorado. The 3rd against Chicago here at the Dome, an 8 p.m. start time on Saturday. So, Matt, first off, how do you think they'll do against Buffalo, and do you think that David Riddick plays in net? To both your questions, yes. I think both Riddick starts in that and the Flames get two points. 
So what's your prediction for the week? Uh, they'll split Colorado and Chicago. I think they'll lose to Colorado and beat Chicago. So you think that they win against Buffalo and uh, Chicago? Buffalo, yeah. And they lose to Colorado. All right, I'm going to make the first bold prediction of the year. I think we sweep this week. Okay, works for me. I think I, I'm hoping that after that game in Toronto, I think they can beat Buffalo, and I'm hoping that coming back to Colorado and Chicago, neither team's great, and I think that it depends which Calgary Flames show up. If it's the Calgary Flames that showed up against um, New York, we got no hope. If it's the Calgary Flames that showed up against Washington or Toronto, I think they got it all week. But we will find out. And like you said, yeah. it's... Well, Buffalo's a little better of it. It's consistency, right? Buffalo's a little better this year, but they're not that great. So they're beatable. Yeah, and and this team seems to play well when Riddick's in net too. Yeah. And I agree. I think Riddick will be in net tomorrow night. Do you play Riddick for any of the other two games this week? Depends on how Riddick plays, frankly. If he plays well, I'd still give Smith the Colorado game just because of his performance today. But then I, you'd see basically how each of them played the last game that they played. For me, I think I would start a system with Riddick, not so much with Smitty, but with Riddick of play till you lose. Yeah. We'll put you in, and you can you got to earn your time in net. Yeah. And, you know, when he, when he loses, um, or you can't really say it's a bad game because that's subjective, but... When he loses, then it's Smitty's net again. You don't necessarily play Smitty till he loses, but you play him until the next scheduled backup appearance. Yeah. I could see that, and like especially if Riddick continues to play like he has thus far this season, it's hard to take him out. Frankly, you know, especially with Smith being so inconsistent, where he has either an awesome game or is abysmal, and like no in between. Yeah, and with the team, you know, seemingly playing well in front of the backup for the first time in as long as I can remember, I think that the team could rally behind that too. It's like, okay, let's keep playing well for David so he keeps getting starts. Well, I agree. Well, Matt, that's it for that's it for this week. The end of October, we finally made it to the end of the month, five hundred or better, which I didn't think we were going to yeah, do, especially with the schedule. So that's a little accomplishment. Now they just got to go beat Buffalo tomorrow. They make it a little better and we will be recording next on the 5th so we'll see how november starts off thank you for listening everybody have a good week and always go flames go go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino fireside chat is licensed under creative commons license for full license details visit firesidechat.ca